Monster Guys present a Yokai podcast presentation, bringing to life, through short stories and informative discussion, the strange, the beautiful, the whimsical, and the mystery of Japanese yokai. Now, please enjoy a story about Ibaraki Doji in a story titled The Ogre of Roshomon by Ye Theodora Ozaki, narrated by C. Michael McGannon, and presented by the Monster Guys. Long, long ago in Kyoto, the people of the city were terrified by accounts of a dreadful ogre, who, it was said, haunted the gate of Rashomon at twilight and seized whoever passed by. The missing victims were never seen again, so it was whispered that the ogre was a horrible cannibal, who not only killed the unhappy victims, but ate them also. Now, everybody in the town and neighborhood was in great fear, and no one dares to venture out after sunset near the gate of Rashomon. Now at this time there lived in Kyoto a general named Raiko, who had made himself famous for his brave deeds. Sometime before this, He made the country ring with his name, for he had attacked Oyama, where a band of ogres lived with their chief, who instead of wine, drank the blood of human beings. He had rooted them all out and cut off the head of the chief monster. This brave warrior was always followed by a band of faithful knights. In this band there were five knights of great valor. One evening as the five knights sat at a feast, quaffing sake and their rice bowls and eating all kinds of fish, raw and stewed, and broiled, and toasting each other's healths and exploits, the first knight, Hojo, said to the others, Have you all heard the rumor that every evening after sunset, there comes an ogre to the gate of Rashomon, and that he seizes all who pass by? The second knight, Watanabe, answered him, saying, Do not talk such nonsense. All the ogres were killed by our chief Raiko at Oyama. It cannot be true, because even if any ogres did escape from that great killing, They would not dare to show themselves in the city, for they know that our brave master would at once attack them if he knew that any of them were still alive. Then do you disbelieve what I say, and think that I am telling you a falsehood? No, I do not think that you are telling a lie, said Watanabe. But you have heard some old woman's story, which is not worth believing. Then the best plan is to prove what I say, by going there yourself and finding out yourself whether it is true or not, said Hojo. Watanabe, the second knight, could not bear the thought that his companion should believe he was afraid, so he answered quickly, Of course, I will go at once and find out for myself. So Watanabe at once got ready to go. He buckled on his long sword and put on a coat of armor, and tied it on his large helmet. When he was ready to start, he said to the others, Give me something so that I can prove I have been there. Then one of the men got out a roll of writing paper and his box of Indian ink and brushes and the four comrades wrote their names on a piece of paper. I will take this, said Watanabe, and put it on the gate of Rashomon. So tomorrow morning will you all go and look at it. I may be able to catch an ogre or two by then. And he mounted his horse and rode off gallantly. It was a very dark night, and there was neither moon nor star to light Watanabe on his way. To make the darkness worse, a storm came on. The rain fell heavily, and the wind howled like wolves in the mountains. Any ordinary man would have trembled at the thought of going outdoors. But Watanabe was a brave warrior and dauntless, and his honor and word were at stake. So he sped on into the night, while his companions listened to the sound of his horse's hoofs dying away in the distance, then shut the sliding shutters close and gathered round the charcoal fire and wondered what would happen, and whether their comrade would encounter one of those horrible oni. At last, Watanabe reached the gate of Rashomon, but peer as he might through the darkness, he could see no sign of an ogre. It is just as I thought, said Watanabe to himself. There are certainly no ogres here. It is only an old woman's story. I will stick this paper on the gate so that the others can see that I have been here when they come tomorrow, and then I will take my way home and laugh at them all. He fastened the piece of paper, signed by all four companions, on the gate, and then turned his horse's head towards home. As he did so, he became aware that someone was behind him, and at that same time a voice called out to him to wait. Then his helmet was seized from the back. Who are you? said Watanabe fearlessly. 
He then put out his hand and groped around to find out who or what it was that held him by the helmet. As he did so, he touched something that felt like an arm. It was covered with hair and as big round as the trunk of a tree. Watanabe knew at once that this was the arm of an ogre, so he drew his sword and cut at it fiercely. There was a loud yell of pain, and then the ogre dashed in front of the warrior. Watanabe's eyes grew large with wonder, for he saw that the ogre was taller than the great gate. His eyes were flashing like mirrors in the sunlight, and his huge mouth was wide open. And as the monster breathed, flames of fire shot out of his mouth. The ogre thought to terrify his foe, but Watanabe never flinched. He attacked the ogre with all of his strength, and thus they fought face to face for a long time. At last, the ogre, finding that he could neither frighten nor beat Watanabe and that he might himself be beaten, took to flight. But Watanabe, determined not to let the monster escape, put spurs to his horse and gave chase. But though the knight rode very fast, the ogre ran faster, and to his disappointment, he found himself unable to overtake the monster, who was gradually lost to sight. Watanabe returned to the gate, where the fierce fight had taken place, and got down from his horse. As he did so, he stumbled upon something lying on the ground. Stooping to pick it up, he found that it was one of the ogre's huge arms, which he must have slashed off in the fight. His joy was great at having secured such a prize, for this was the best of all proofs of his adventure with the ogre. So he took it up carefully and carried it home as a trophy of his victory. When he got back, he showed the arm to his comrades, who one and all called him the hero of their band and gave him a great feast. His wonderful deed was soon noised abroad in Kyoto, and people from far and near came to see the ogre's arm. Watanabe now began to grow uneasy as to how he should keep the arm in safety, for he knew that the ogre to whom it belonged was still alive. He felt sure that one day or other, as soon as the ogre got over his scare, he would come to try to get his arm back again. Watanabe therefore had a box made of the strongest wood and banded it with iron. In this, he placed the arm, and then he sealed down the heavy lid, refusing to open it for anyone. He kept the box in his own room and took charge of it himself never allowing it out of his sight. Now one night he heard someone knocking at the porch, asking for admittance. When the servant went to the door to see who it was, there was only an old woman, very respectable in appearance. On being asked who she was and what was her business, the old woman replied with a smile that she had been nurse to the master of the house when he was a little baby. If the lord of the house were at home, she begged to be allowed to see him. The servant left the old woman at the door and went to tell his master that his old nurse had come to see him. Watanabe thought it strange that she should come at that time of night. But at the thought of his old nurse, who had been like a foster mother to him and whom he had not seen for a long time, a very tender feeling sprang up for her in his heart. He ordered the servant to show her in. The old woman was ushered into the room, and after the customary bows and greetings were over, she said, Master, the report of your brave fight with the ogre at the gate of Rashomon is so widely known that even your poor old nurse has heard of it. Is it really true, what everyone says, that you cut off one of the ogre's arms? If you did, your deed is highly to be praised. I was very disappointed, said Watanabe, that I was not able to take the monster captive, which was what I wished to do, instead of only cutting off an arm. I am very proud to think, answered the old woman, that my master was so brave as to dare to cut off an ogre's arm. There is nothing that can be compared to your courage. Before I die, it is the great wish of my life to see this arm, she added pleadingly. No, said Watanabe, I am sorry, but I cannot grant your request. But why? asked the old woman. Because, replied Watanabe, ogres are very revengeful creatures. And if I open the box, there is no telling but that the ogre may suddenly appear and carry off his arm. I have had a box made on purpose, with a very strong lid, and in this box I keep the ogre's arm secure, and I never show it to anyone, whatever happens. Your precaution is very reasonable, said the old woman. But I am your old nurse, so surely you will not refuse to show me the arm. I have only just heard of your brave act, and not being able to wait till the morning, I came at once to ask you to show it to me. Watanabe was very troubled at the old woman's pleading, but he still persisted in refusing. Then the old woman said, Do you suspect me of being a spy sent by the ogre? No, of course, I do not suspect you of being the ogre's spy, for you are my old nurse, answered Watanabe. Then you cannot surely refuse to show me the arm any longer, entreated the old woman, for it is the great wish of my heart to see it for once in my life, 
the arm of an ogre. Watanabe could not hold out in his refusal any longer, so he gave in at last, saying, Then I will show you the ogre's arm, since you so earnestly wish to see it. Come, follow me. And he led the way to his own room, the old woman following. When they were both in the room, Watanabe shut the door carefully, and then going towards a big box which stood in a corner of the room, he took off the heavy lid. He then called the old woman to come near and look in, for he never took the arm out of the box. What is it like? Let me have a good look at it, said the old nurse with a joyful face. She came nearer and nearer, as if she were afraid, till she stood right against the box. Suddenly, she plunged her hand into the box and seized the arm, crying with a fearful voice which made the room shake. Oh joy, I have got my arm back again. And from an old woman, she was suddenly transformed into the towering figure of the frightful ogre. Watanabe sprang back and was unable to move for a moment. So great was his astonishment. But recognizing the ogre, who had attacked him at the gate of Rashomon, he determined with his usual courage to put an end to him this time. He seized his sword, drew it out of its sheath in a flash, and tried to cut the ogre down. So quick was Watanabe that the creature had a narrow escape. But the ogre sprang up to the ceiling, and bursting through the roof, disappeared into the mist and clouds. In this way, the ogre escaped with his arm. The knight gnashed his teeth with disappointment, but that was all he could do. He waited in patience for another opportunity to dispatch the ogre, but the latter was afraid of Watanabe's great strength and daring, and never troubled Kyoto again. So once more the people of the city were able to go out without fear, even at night time, and the brave deeds of Watanabe have never been forgotten. I've long been fascinated with this story, and particularly with this gate <laughs> in Japanese history. It's both a fun story and a brutal history that's depicted through this tale. And it's an interesting retelling, an interesting translation that's read here. So, the Gate of Rashomon and the story of Ibaraki Doji. Uh, a very cool story indeed, and reaching back to a classic in Japanese folk tales. Yeah, and a topic that seems to be of interest to us a lot as of late. It is. You know, we actually started doing talks on this particular location in Japan and this particular story, I want to say maybe four years ago, when we started writing about it a little bit in our young adult series, Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Hunters. This week, it just so happens, <laughs> wink, wink, shameless plug, <laughs> we're not doing any marketing here <laughs> at all. But this week, as it so happens, the fourth book in that series has been released, and it's called Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Hunters, The Dragon Gate, book four in that series. And of course, in our story, we refer to the Demon Gate or the Gate of Rashomon as the Dragon Gate because of story elements and creative license a little bit there, but... <laughs> It was a lot of fun, and I'm glad we actually got to write about that location and that historical event, that folk legend, in one of our stories so extensively. Uh, as a matter of fact, in that book, Shuten Doji, Ibaraki Doji, the Oni, and that gate are all very prominent centerpieces in that story. Yeah, and it should be noted right now, they're never named in this particular story. And we'll talk about why a little bit more in a second, the actual translation of the story, but the chief of the ogres or the chief of the oni <laughs> right. uh, that the story refers to in the beginning is Shuten Doji, the king of demons, who we also did a story about on uh, the Yokai podcast a few episodes ago. Yeah, I can't remember the name of that episode, but off the top of my head, but it was, I think, a, a funnier story in life. Uh, and then you have, of course, the, the ogre of Rashomon that this story refers to. I, I think that story was Talking Heads. Was that it? If I'm not mistaken, because he was carrying around the head of Shuten Doji, taking him to another location, another temple. Who would not stop talking. <laughs> Who would not stop talking. I, I wanted was to say... kind of humorous. I wanted to say Talking Heads, but we've... You know, Japanese stories have a lot to do with 
decapitated yes. or floating <laughs> or gigantic random heads. So I couldn't remember. Yeah, which sure. by the way, side note, total side note, during dinner earlier this evening, I watched Kubo and the Two Strings. A lot of cool Japanese folktale in that movie. And uh, I mean, folklore in that movie. I immediately was taken to the image on the front cover of our copy of Quidon from Lafcadio Hearn because of one of the creatures in that show, um, a yokai being featured. So I thought that was cool. Total side note, <laughs> completely away from the topic. So we have Shuten Doji kind of referenced in here. You also have, of course, not referenced, but um, kind of the, the center of focus, the ogre of Rashomon, who is never named, but that character is Ibaraki Doji. Yeah. Ibaraki is a fascinating character to me because you have, number one, you're not sure if Ibaraki is a he or a she. She, I'm going to call her a she because that's actually how that character is written in our book. But Shuten Doji's lieutenant, mm -hmm. and she is a she and a very powerful and fierce she. Yeah. In, in Sounds like a poem. <laughs> and a haiku, <laughs> I guess. Monster guy's haiku. Yeah, Ibaraki Doji is, in this story even, Ibaraki is referred to as a he, uh, you know, a, a big, monstrous, hairy creature. But Ibaraki is sometimes noted in other Japanese fairy tales and folklore as a she. And I don't think she's overshadowed, but she does kind of take that background spot sometimes. And yet she is still a very mischievous, and when I say mischievous, I mean very dangerous creature. After the events of this story, she disappears for the most part, but she's still seen from time to time um, later on just kind of causing trouble. Um, and her her complete whereabouts are unknown. Even to this day. Even to this day, which we speculate we, on. We are searching for her <laughs> right now. So I don't know. She's just a, kind of an interesting character to me because, uh, it, you know, she's the first other rambunctious child that Shuten Doji meets when he's still semi-human and when Ibaraki is still semi-human. And they, as a pair, go and start recruiting other horrendous human beings and they all turn into ogres later on through their, their terribleness, which I think you wanted to talk a little bit about Oni um, as a topic as well. It's something that we, we come across often in our shows, but haven't really gotten to the, the baseline. Yeah, and I think probably that's a topic for a full another podcast, but there's some crossover definition here with regards to Oni, because we see the term ogre used, we see the term Oni used, and we see the term demon used in various places. And there's a little bit of crossover there, but there are some still pretty clear lines there as well that I think should be defined. Yeah, and I definitely would like to do a full a full episode on them. You know, when Oni were brought over to Japan, they originally were forces of nature. So it's all very interesting how they, I mean, they are shapeshifters um, <laughs> even nowadays, but it's kind of interesting how their form, if you will, seemed to shift and change throughout the years into a, a more sl solid character. Um, it is interesting as well to point out the difference in size. Sometimes Oni are seen as being, you know, you know human sized, just like they start right. out the story. In this story, it talks about how the ogre was bigger than the gate of Rashomon. And Which is no small thing. Yeah, I wanted to point that out because it, it really is not. When I very first heard about the Demon Gate or Rashomon, you know, I thought it was going to be just a, a normal city gate. But this this was thought to be well over the size of a, a modern day house, like two, three stories high, extremely wide. So it was not a small statement to say that it was bigger than the gate itself. Yeah, which makes me wonder if the warrior could reach back and grab the arm, how big was that warrior? And are we exaggerating for the sake of glory, you know, look at my big fish type of thing? <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, regardless, I mean, for an Oni to be that size, an ogre to be that size, that that's like a small mountain. Yeah. And remember, she's a shapeshifter as well. So it could be a, you know, a thing of growing to intimidate or frighten off the warrior, which, as we saw, backfired greatly. I think it's interesting to talk about real quick the translation of this as well. You know, I was making a comment earlier, older stories are easier to read in some places, but they use some of those old fashioned words that kind of trip you up sometimes. Yeah, I think this was translated in what, 1908? Uh, I believe so, yes, 1908, by Ye Theodora Ozaki, who has a similar, you know, she took a similar function to people like Lafcadio Hearn and the Brothers Grimm. 
Her father was one of the first Japanese people to come over and study in art culture. So it was kind of a, an interesting thing. And you can kind of see that in her middle name that, you know, he obviously was very influenced. And she, in turn, uh, translated a lot of old Japanese fairy tales to English for us here. Yeah, but sometimes that old English is a little difficult to read out loud. It is. But interestingly enough, this story is easier to read than some European folk tales. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I find that Most kind of funny. Certain. Certainly, you are correct. Didn't have a lot of these and those and forth withs and such what. <laughs> such what? Is, is such what a, That's exactly a European the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all in all, it, this is kind of a charming tale to me. It holds that note of danger that's in the original story, carries over the menace and the spectacular nature. But at the same time, it's just kind of a, I don't know, the translation is to me warm. It is. It's a fun story. And again, as I stated earlier, it's it's one that I've long been fascinated with because it encompasses a lot of history for Japan and a lot of their uh, folk legends with regards to Oni and the gate and, and a lot of things that took place there. So it's a fun story all around. I, I love it. And I'm glad we dipped back into a classic this week to bring this one forward. I will say that you have written a yokai tale that we'll begin featuring next month. And I want to give it away, but it's a two-part. We've never done a two-part, but it's a two-part yokai tale that will begin next month. And pretty excited to hear about that when you've written almost um, almost a Lovecraftian yokai <laughs> tale. So it'll be, it'll be fun to dive into that. That was the thought. And it is kind of inspired by old Lovecraft narrative and the way that he he wrote some of the, the journal entries of characters. I, I always enjoyed that. And I, I tried to not do that too much because a lot of people kind of criticized him for it. But it's also inspired by stories like this because the, the characters you see, like Raiko and uh, specifically Watanabe, Watanabe was actually known in history as Watanabe Natsuna. And you have that whole band of knights and fierce warriors, they were actually historical uh, figures. And you have that a lot in Japan where you have very historical people, very document, like well-documented characters that go off and fight Oni and fight um, different spirits and Yure and monsters and so forth. So it's almost like you still have the knights going off to fight the dragons, but you know, you know, it's not a nameless, faceless knight. It's a real historical person. So their history is still highly blended with mythology, and that's fascinating to me. And so taking that Lovecraftian narrative and putting it to that question of why is history so tied to mythology is hopefully going to turn out fun for people. I think it will. Earlier, we uh, we mentioned that this particular story takes some precedence in our newest book in our Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Hunters series for young adults. If you are interested in that, you can find that listing uh, on our books tab on the monsterguys.com or just look it up Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or Kobo uh, or iBooks if you are so inclined. <laughs> just look up Charlie Sullivan and the Monster Hunters series. There's four books in the series, book four. We do a bit of globe trotting through this series and in book four we begin in Japan. We end up all over the world in this particular book but we're, we're focused uh, on that particular region of Japan and we're very excited to do so. As everybody knows, we love Japanese folklore, so it was fun to write that into this series. Um, also, we do have uh, a book called Yokai Tales, stories from Japan's grand and mysterious tradition of folklore that we wrote and put out last year, and they are individual stories with a little bit of write-up on each stories and a little bit of artwork to go with it. If you're interested in that, I think that's also listed in our book's tab on the website. We'd appreciate you checking those out, picking those up. Yokai Tales 2 will actually be out, I think, in just a couple of months. Uh, that one is wrapping up, as well as our very first, uh, what I'll just call our European folktale <laughs> book, original stories and some classic stories mixed in with some commentary as well. So we're excited, kind of building our folklore library written by us and or compiled by us as well. So we'd hope that everybody would take a moment, check those out. And uh, if you like books for all ages, Charlie Sullivan's series is a good one. If you like horror, we've got our chaos short stories available as well. Uh, and of course, Yokai Tales and Folklore to Come. There's a lot going on this year with us in terms of writing. We've kind of taken 2017 and we're focused on our stories and getting back to writing our books. So 
Yeah, we do. We do have a lot out there. Charlie Sullivan, Chaos, Yokai, Such With, <clears throat> Such With, <laughs> Such Whats, and Such Whis with your European. Was it Such lingo. What? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Uh, so thanks for hanging out with us. As always, find us at themonsterguys.com. Please chit chat with us on Twitter at the Monster Guys or like us on Facebook and hang out with us there. Again, just look up facebook.com forward slash the Monster Guys. We love hanging out with you guys and hearing from you guys. We are also now hanging out with FolkloreThursday.com on Twitter every Thursday, and every once in a while we'll be doing guest hosting for that particular conversation and uh, with that community, and very excited about that. A lot of good folklore information. Oh my gosh, it is just such a wealth of folklore, mythology, stories, anecdotes, pictures, archaeology, history, you name it. It's flowing through. Uh, so we encourage you to check that out. Go to twitter.com and punch in the hashtag Folklore Thursday on Thursdays and um, just be amazed at everything that happens there and join the conversation. It's a lot of fun. Every once in a while, we'll get to help host with the community there, but we just love being a part of it. So we, we'd encourage you to hang out with us and, and learn more there. Uh, in the meantime, don't show off your monstrous trophies. You never know when they want to reclaim their parts. That's true. <laughs> and be careful which parts you take. <laughs> so, also true. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>